Hello, welcome to CIA Files, True Stories of U.S. Intelligence. I'm Topher M. Ford, and with me is my co-host, Brandon Givens. Well, hello. I am very happy to be here, and this is going to be a great adventure for all of us. The plan is for us to dive into the history of the Central Intelligence Agency by highlighting stories of the individuals who were caught up in the CIA's operations and the people who influenced its directions and tactics. I'm going to be telling the story, and Brandon will provide some larger historical context to help us understand the world as it was at that time. So I've been working in journalism for about 10 years now. I'm a news and politics addict, and I decided a while back that I wanted to study the history of the CIA, so I figured I'd document what I learned because I don't have anything better to do. Uh, What about you, Brandon? Yep, I'm a history teacher. I've spent a lot of time traveling the world, backpacking, really enjoy it. Uh, live outside of the United States right now. And so uh, you've done a great job researching these characters, and I've enjoyed providing some historical context uh, for these episodes. And I also like providing a sort of lighthearted, humanistic angle and and playing devil's advocate whenever I can. So I'm going to be honest, uh, learning about the CIA has presented some uh, challenges to my mental health Uh, Just learning about the different ways that they've manipulated facts and information, uh, it breeds this particularly insidious sort of doubt. And that doubt, uh, which has become a widespread issue in this country and abroad, is something we're going to be discussing as the show progresses as a byproduct of their paranoia and their manipulation of the truth along with their clandestine operations, manipulations, and secret experiments. The CIA has damaged the public's trust in the U.S. government in ways that more and more seem to be irreparable. Case in point, the subject of our very first episode, a man named George Hunter White. White played a key role in the infamous Project MKUltra, and he was one of the biggest perpetrators of unethical criminal activity in the CIA's search for mind control. And this first episode is what you might call his origin story. Before we begin, a quick mention of our main sources. The first is the book Poisoner in Chief by Stephen Kinzer. It's a biography on MK Ultra mastermind Sidney Gottlieb, who will pop up here and there in this episode, and who I'm, I know we will be covering more in depth in the future. Gottlieb will definitely get his own series here eventually. Poisoner in Chief by Steve Kinzer is an amazing book. I can't recommend it enough. The other main source for the episode and the next episode as a series of articles for the website Counterpunch by Douglas Valentine. You can find a list of all of our sources and links to uh, everything if you want to do some additional reading on your own at our website, ciafiles.net. So without further blathering, we present George Hunter White, Part 1, Actually a Heretic. We are not professing to tell you the complete story of these activities. We are professing to tell you the complete story that we know. These records that we've uncovered don't tell the story. This is CIA Files. They tell pieces of it. True stories of U.S. intelligence. George Hunter White stands out, even in the dazzling MKUltra cast of obsessed chemists, cold-hearted spy masters, grim torturers, hypnotists, electroshockers, and Nazi doctors. He was a hard-charging narcotics detective who lived large in the twilight world of crime and drugs. Stephen Kinzer, Poisoner-in-Chief I was a very minor missionary, actually a heretic, but I toiled wholeheartedly in the vineyards because it was fun, fun, fun. Where else could a red-blooded American boy lie, kill, cheat, steal, rape and pillage 
with the sanctions and blessing of the All-Highest. George Hunter White Few people seem to be so lucky as to discover their true purpose in life, and even fewer seem tenacious enough to truly dedicate their entire lives to that purpose. In that regard, George Hunter White may have been the luckiest, most tenacious man to ever live. White's life was one of lies, drugs, sex, manipulation, coercion, extortion, violence, and murder, and when he reached the end of his life, he was long considered a hero by many. White seemed to be the prototype for what has become a prevalent character in pop culture, the slovenly, degenerate, crooked cop. Steve Kinzer painted a colorful portrait of White in his book, Poisoner in Chief. White stood five foot seven inches, weighed over 200 pounds, and shaved his head. Writers have described him as fat and bull-like, a vastly obese slab of a man who looked like an extremely menacing bowling ball. His first wife, who divorced him in 1945, called him a fat slob. White also loved sadomasochism, often hiring prostitutes to tie him down and whip him. He held an affinity for women's shoes and boots. His first marriage lasted only one year, but White found true love with his second wife, Albertine Califf, whom he married in 1951. According to Steve Kinzer, she loved the same sexual exploits that White enjoyed. She also shared White's affinity for drugs, booze, rough play, and women's luxury footwear. Albertine, or Teen for short, always spoke highly of her notorious husband. In a 2002 interview with Counterpunch, she praised her late husband's intelligence, cunning, and even his writing skills. And she denied the image of White as a violent thug, describing him instead as a liberal Democrat. But author Douglas Valentine wasn't convinced of her reliability when it came to her description of her husband or of herself. When he asked her about Barbara Smith, one of White's unwitting LSD victims. Her response was anything but measured. Indeed, when this writer asked her what George White did to Barbara on the night of January 11, 1953, the 80-plus-year-old woman descended into a string of expletives that would have embarrassed a sailor. Her tirade left this writer with the firm impression that she was thoroughly capable of having been White's accomplice in his dirty work. Teen very likely assisted White with many of the highly strange, highly unclinical, and highly unethical secret experiments he performed on unwitting subjects on behalf of the United States government. Born in 1906, White grew up in Los Angeles, California. In 1928, he started working as a police reporter first for the San Francisco Bulletin, then the City News Service. White's early work as an investigative reporter exposed his talent for digging through dirt to find whatever he was looking for. For a short while, he investigated libel suits brought against the Los Angeles Evening and Herald Express, which led him to other work as a private investigator. In the 1930s, White began looking for investigative government work. He applied to the FBI twice, but he never made the cut from the FBI file. White appeared to be casting about in various government investigative agencies seeking a position. It was further stated that his personality, approach, and appearance were not up to bureau standards. He was granted a re-examination at Portland, Oregon, February 11, 1937, and was not recommended. He said he drank intoxicants in moderation and commented that he did not drink over a pint of whiskey in a week or ten days. In the meantime, he worked as a patrol inspector in Calexico, California, for the U.S. Border Patrol, where he occasionally worked alongside officers from the relatively new Federal Bureau of Narcotics. Brandon Givens explains how this new bureau started with a humble task, but would quickly begin to influence U.S. policy. They were founded as a reorganization of departments charged with taxing and controlling the importation of narcotics with narcotics also including cocaine. Their focus originally was opium and cocaine and their derivatives. They had offices around the world to work with local law enforcement to stop heroin smuggling, but there really weren't that many agents. 
Under this agency, though, you begin to see a push for harsher penalties and adding more substances to the controlled substances list, like marijuana. White apparently hated his time with the Border Patrol, so when his colleagues in the FBN suggested he apply to their agency, he jumped at the chance. He went to work for the Bureau of Narcotics in 1936 and made a name for himself by breaking up a major Chinese opium ring. After his big win, White transferred to New York City, where he would play a distressingly large role in the history of the United States, considering his character, motives, and total lack of concern for the well-being of other humans. In an interview with CBS, White's colleague from the Bureau of Narcotics, Charles Siragusa, described a lesson White once taught him about handling people who were disrespectful. He said, one of, one of our men gets beat up, he says, you have to act real fast and teach these guys a lesson. He said, I'll come around, he says, and break your kneecaps. And with that one guy laughed, and George would always have a little, uh, little billy with him. And this one guy sort of snickered, George White turned around and whapped him across the neck with it. Then he picked up a pool stick and started beating everybody up. He made his point. And he made his point. Despite his penchant for violence and debauchery, White still displayed the occasional moment of vulnerability. He once owned a canary that he loved to hold and pet. He was heartbroken when it died. He wrote about the bird's death in his journal. Poor little bastard just couldn't make it. I don't know if I'll ever get another bird or pet. It's tough on everyone when they die. As White was making a name for himself beating on drug dealers, the Second World War was brewing. And while the vast majority of Americans wanted to stay out of the war, by mid-1941, it was clear, at least to those in power, that the U.S. would get involved no matter what the people wanted. To think of America's attitude to World War II, you have to go back to World War I. There were lots of World War I vets who had returned with PTSD. They came back to a nation in the middle of the Prohibition Drug War. Things were a mess. They'd been told World War I was the war to end all wars. And that clearly didn't work out. In March of 1941, Roosevelt got Lend Lease pushed through. Now, this is a tap dance to be neutral, not neutral. Basically, the arms weren't sold. They were exchanged for leased access to military bases. So the U.S. gives England or Russia military equipment, and in return, those countries give the U.S. access to their military bases. At this point, though, the U.S. Navy is de facto at war. German submarines are attacking U.S. ships, and U.S. ships are escorting merchant vessels. But December 7th, Pearl Harbor occurs, and at that point, war was inevitable. It was also becoming apparent to President Roosevelt and his cabinet that America was ill-prepared for this war in at least one important way. We had no dedicated intelligence service. After the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, Roosevelt created the Office of Strategic Services to fill this gap, placing well-connected lawyer and war hero William Wild Bill Donovan in charge. Brandon explains how Donovan, understanding America's inevitable involvement, worked with Roosevelt to ease the U.S. into the war as smoothly and effectively as possible. He began to suspect that a second war was coming and cultivated his international relationships. Roosevelt also expected war and was well aware of Donovan's feelings. Roosevelt tasked Donovan with finding out how likely it was that England could hold off a German invasion. He returned with a report positive of England's chances. Nonetheless, Franklin Roosevelt was quite concerned about the U.S.'s intelligence gathering capabilities. Canadian British spy extraordinaire William Stevenson was sent to meet with Roosevelt and he suggested Wild Bill Donovan create an intelligence agency for the U.S. Donovan and Stevens worked together to create the first Office of Strategic Services, basing it off of the existing British military establishment. The OSS was basically the CIA before the CIA. 
They also focused on dropping people behind enemy lines to train and organize resistance fighters, which today would also be a special forces task. Bureau of Narcotics head Harry Anslinger, impressed with White's investigative skills, suggested he would do well there. White enlisted at Camp X, the new secret spy training compound established in Alberta, Canada, which White called, quote, the school of murder and mayhem. Camp X was a spy school in Canada. It was set up by codename Intrepid, Sir William Stevenson. Stevenson was a Canadian himself, but a British spy. The camp was built while the U.S. was still technically neutral. It worked as a place where the British spies could train their American and Canadian counterparts in behind-the-lines warfare and spycraft, and that they did. After completing his training, White became a trainer himself. Agents would need exceptionally devious skills to complete their missions, and Camp X needed an exceptionally devious man to teach those skills. So after graduating, White led Camp X's school on counterintelligence techniques. White's expertise lay in teaching people how to commit crimes, including various techniques of torture and surreptitious murder, and to do them without getting caught. He trained more than a few people who would become key figures in the CIA, including Richard Helms, Frank Wisner, James Jesus Angleton, and William Colby. White served as a spy overseas during the war as well. His 1975 obituary in the San Francisco Examiner included a colorful story about White saving an American soldier from certain death in India. He was hiding in the closet of a Calcutta fleabag hotel room, his trusty nickel-plated thirty-eight in his hand, when a Japanese agent, trying to make a deal with an American soldier, suddenly pulled a dagger and started to plunge it into the GI's back. The spy never knew what hit him as Colonel White emerged from the closet, his pistol firing. He carried the pistol in his belt all his career, even after he retired. There were too many old enemies. White's job during the war was intended to be a service to his country. But in reality, it was just another excuse for him to satisfy his lust for violence. Journalist Johan Hari described a brutal murder White committed under the guise of public service and his thoughts on the act later. The Japanese man couldn't breathe. Colonel George White, a vastly obese white slab of a man, had his hands tightened around his throat and he was not letting go. It was the last thing the Japanese man ever saw. Once it was all over, White told the authorities he strangled this Jap because he believed he was a spy, but privately he told his friends he didn't really know if his victim was a spy at all, and he didn't care. I have a lot of friends who are murderers, he bragged years later, and I had very good times in their company. He boasted to his friends that he kept a photo of the man he had throttled hanging on the wall of his apartment, always watching him. During the course of his work with the Bureau of Narcotics, White became familiar with the cast of characters in organized crime in the seedy underworld of 1930s New York, especially noted mob accountant Meyer Lansky. White kept Lansky out of trouble with the law, and Lansky helped White with the war effort. The Mafia, of course, had its hand in prostitution, drugs, and gambling. In the 1930s, the New York Mafia had a major hand in the docks. Well, that's where the drugs came in. They had also found their way into the unions, namely the stevedores and teamsters. This makes sense because controlling the docks and drivers helps them control their logistics. Now, Meyer Lansky, he was a Jewish immigrant from present-day Belarus. He grew up in the U.S. alongside the juvenile gangsters such as Bugsy Siegel, he got himself involved in a protection racket. He convinced the other Jewish kids to pay kids such as Bugsy for protection. And so Meyer developed quite a name for himself. He was known as being smart. He was very criminal, but he was also very trustworthy. He was heavily involved in gambling and very well respected within the mafia. I guess you could call him an honest crook. So honest, a former U.S. congressman arranged for Langsy 
to have speakers at American Nazi party rallies beaten on stage. White utilized his mafia and smuggler connections to sniff out enemies trying to slip over U.S. borders and to foil any attempts at sabotage on U.S. soil. To do this, he recruited people already familiar with committing crimes, especially killers, as assassins and special agents for the OSS. It was also during this time that White first began testing the use of drugs to aid interrogation. White reportedly conducted the first test on New York gangster August Del Grazio by giving him marijuana-laced cigarettes to see if he would reveal important secret information after getting high. According to The Search for the Manchurian Candidate by John Marks, the experiment yielded positive results. White plied him with cigarettes until subject became high and extremely garrulous. Over the next two hours, Del Gracio told the federal agent about the ins and outs of the drug trade, revealing information so sensitive that the CIA deleted it from the OSS documents it released 34 years later. At one point in the conversation, after Del Gracio had begun to talk, the gangster told White, Whatever you do, don't ever use any of the stuff I'm telling you. White also worked for Division 19, a World War II-era project aimed at testing different drugs on people, often prisoners, to find ways to enhance interrogations and force subjects to reveal secret information about America's enemies. These experiments included testing the effects of heroin, cocaine, sedatives, amphetamine, and a concentrated form of THC, the psychoactive compound in cannabis. World War II eventually ended, and the OSS was disbanded. Afterward, White slipped right back into his old shoes at the Bureau of Narcotics, just in time for another war, this time on jazz. Harry Anslinger worked enforcing prohibition and then became the founding commissioner of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics. Now, when working as a prohibition agent, he had said marijuana was harmless. After prohibition ended, he changed his mind and began to engineer congressional hearings to put marijuana under federal control. He teamed up with Hearst and published gore accounts of people gone wild on marijuana. He focused on people killing their families while under the influence of marijuana or somehow in association with marijuana. Marijuana, the dried leaves and flowers of the Indian hemp weed, is used in the form of a cigarette. Marijuana smoking, experts point out, can make a helpless addict of its victim within weeks, causing physical and moral ruin and death. Let's go, Jack, I'm red hot. The truth is that every reefer is loaded with immorality and bestial perversion, brutality, murder, sex crimes, insanity or suicide. Should you ever be confronted with the temptation of taking that first puff of a marijuana cigarette. Don't do it. He also liked to publish stories of white women being seduced, impregnated, kidnapped, or given an STD by black men while under the influence of marijuana. He targeted jazz musicians especially those that spoke out against injustice. See, jazz was a countercultural force, and arresting people for drugs was a way to disrupt it. Candidly, though, Anslinger admits that Hollywood and Broadway were also full of drugs, but they were protected by financial interest. They were making the right people too much money to be touched. White dove into the war on jazz with enthusiasm. He cultivated his own fame and public image, sometimes even bringing newspaper reporters with him on raids. White fit in especially well with the drug scene in New York for another reason. He loved doing drugs. White always kept some of whatever he confiscated and used everything he could find. White took a special pleasure in bringing down black jazz artists by having their licenses to perform revoked. White famously targeted singer Billie Holiday. 
He and other narcotics officers bullied and threatened her along with any other artists who performed her music. White managed to have her banned from performing in many of the clubs in New York. He openly despised her, once complaining, She flaunted her way of living with her fancy coats and fancy automobiles and her jewelry and her gowns. She was the big lady wherever she went. White eventually arrested Holiday for opium possession. She claimed that officers planted the opium on her, stating that she'd been clean for a year. While Holiday was eventually acquitted, the ordeal, coupled with White's relentless aggression toward her, contributed to her alcohol abuse, leading to her early death from cirrhosis of the liver at 44. In 1950, White went to work for Senator Joseph McCarthy in the House Un-American Activities Committee, rooting out communists. He quickly shifted to another team investigating organized crime. However, he didn't last the year before he was fired for telling someone that New York Governor Tom Dewey and President Harry Truman were both tied to the mafia. As it happened, the timing was perfect, as head CIA scientist Sidney Gottlieb had a new project that needed a leader. Gottlieb was the head of the Technical Services Staff, the CIA's research and development lab. Gottlieb was expanding research into the use of drugs for interrogation. He discovered a wonderful new compound called LSD, and he believed that this seemingly magical elixir was the key to his primary goal, mind control. Gottlieb knew White from their days in the OSS. White, a bona fide sadist, had loved that work and was thrilled to get on board. So it was that White would become one of only a handful of Americans to learn of and help run one of the most infamous chapters in American history, Project MK Ultra. Well, that was part one. Brandon, what did you think? Oh, it was quite an adventure, and I can't wait to find out what he gets up to later. The, with the war on drugs, woo, and then using them for experimentations. Yeah, and for fun, too. Now, as a side note, I'd just like to clarify that I don't have any issue with White's kinks. We talked about his, he was into sadomasochism, and being tied up and I don't have a problem with any of that I'm fine with people doing whatever they want in the bedroom so long as everyone involved is a consenting adult of course as we'll learn when we go further White wasn't generally too concerned with consent in his professional life and I can imagine he went his entire life without ever even uttering the word consent or even having that word pop into his head All right. Well, we'll be back in a week with a look at international news. There's a lot going on around the world, and we're going to discuss as much of it as we can, including the development with the military coup in Myanmar, Russia's buildup of military force near the Ukrainian border, and a lot of other stuff. And in two weeks, we will return with part two of George Hunter White. And that's when we're going to get into the nitty gritty MK Ultra stuff. Now, you can find us online, Twitter, and Instagram. We are at CIA Files Podcast. Facebook is just CIA Files. And of course, I mentioned earlier our website, CIAFiles.net. And we're not on iTunes just yet. We're working on that and uh, should have that available soon hopefully so if you can please subscribe rate and review if you like what we're doing those things go a long way toward helping the show also a big shout out to our friend and partner joshua travis who is the voice you heard reading our quotes and snippets and he made the music for the show 
and he helps with the audio production. Thanks for listening, and we'll be back next week. Mm-hmm.